structure of this session. Our session will last 50 minutes and will be a question and answer format. Online participant questions must be sent to the chat in the app. Questions from in-person participants should also be sent to the chat in the app or written down in a paper. The topic of our roundtable is immunization in a post-COVID world, what to expect. For the discussion of this topic, we have with us Dr. Ann Ottersen, Senior Managing Manager of the Vaccine Center of UNICEF Supply Division. Dr. Anne has more than 25 years of experience working with procurement and supply of vaccines. Also with us is Dr. Kate O'Brien. She is, is Director of the Immunization Vaccines and Biological Department at the World Health Organization. In this role, she is responsible for leading WHO's strategy and implementation to advance the vision of a world where everyone, everywhere, at every age, fully benefits from vaccines for good health and well-being. Our third invitee is Dr. Andrés de Francisco. He has over 30 years of career dedicated to public health and is currently director of the Department of Family Health Promotion and Life Course at the Pan American Health Organization. And uh, last but not least, here by my side, Dr. Akira Roma, former president of Fiocruz, former director of Bill Manguinhos, vice president of biotechnology of Abifina. He is currently a senior scientific advisor at Bill Manguinhos, Fiocruz, and general scientific coordinator of this symposium, the International Symposium of Immunobiologicals. Uh, of course, we have little time uh, uh, so uh, I have only given you a brief bio of our guests, but I invite everyone to know more about them on the symposium web, web uh, page. And let me thank the, uh, the panelists for accepting our invitation and welcome, the, welcome them for the discussion. And also my apologies for the uh, delay in starting uh, the, this session. Uh, dear, after uh, two years of pandemic, we can say that it was a real tragedy in modern times. More than half a billion cases and six, six million deaths worldwide. And we know these numbers are underreported. On the other hand, several vaccines have been rapidly developed and produced, and 11.6 billion doses have been ad administered so far. We have never seen such a massive mobilization of scientists, institutions, governments, and populations. Even with an unbalanced distribution of vaccines among countries, COVID-19 now seems to become less lethal, and the rapid development and supply of vaccines leaves a legacy for the world. My first question is for Dr. Ann Ottersen. Dr. Ann. With your long experience in purchasing vaccine for low and middle income countries, and with the very important role UNICEF plays in guaranteeing access to these vaccines, has the COVID pandemic changed our way of thinking about time to market for vaccines? Please, uh, Dr. Otto, you have up to five minutes to answer the question and uh, to make any other comments you wish. Thank you very much for the question. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear very well. Wonderful. Honorable Chair, fellow panelists and uh, participants in this symposium, thank you for inviting me on behalf of UNICEF to participate in this uh, very important meeting. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Uh, the question, has it changed our way of thinking about time to market for vaccines? As you already mentioned, there have been... Uh, uh, an accelerated pace to get these vaccines into the market. We used to look at a decade to get new vaccines from the bench to the 
to the market and, and uh, the malaria vaccine that's just been improved for expanded use took like 35 years to get to the market. So I think what we've seen under this pandemic has been an unprecedented global collaboration to bring the vaccines to the market at an accelerated pace. And the first vaccines actually achieved emergency use authorization uh, on December in December 2020, which was less than 12 months after WHO had declared the COVID as a public health emergency of international concern in January 2020. Today, we have more than 10 vaccines that have WHO emergency use listing and, and an overwhelming pipeline of more than 400 uh, vaccine candidates. So there have been a number of levers which I think are, are quite important to, to be uh, aware of and keep in mind. First of all, the risk-willing financing uh, was made available by governments and global organizations such as CEPI, Gates Foundations and others uh, to biotech companies and vaccine manufacturers to accelerate product development. And where trials usually uh, happen in a sequential phase, they were now done in parallel, which have also accelerated the time to market and production at risk was undertaken to get the vaccines out as soon as the regulatory approval was achieved. The regulators have convened at the global level as well, um, agreeing to fast track approaches for uh, recognition of, of products and mutual reliance on assessments done by other regulators. And most low income countries have actually relied on WHO's uh, technical assessment of the products, waiving uh, national requirements for licensure and approval. We've also seen an unprecedented collaboration uh, within the industry amongst vaccine manufacturers, task sharing and operating and contract manufacturing organizations to produce drug substance and, and drug product. Um, so this has been really an unprecedented collaboration at, at all levels. And we've seen new um, participants in the in the vaccine market with biotech manufacturers being able to follow their products through because of this collaboration to, to the market where they would normally divest after phase one or two because of the cost and the complexities. And we've seen the new mRNA uh, vaccine technology platform as well, making it uh, to the market at a rapid pace. So we are hopeful that some of these approaches uh, are here to stay. Innovations in technology platforms can potentially unlock some of the scientific challenges we've struggled with for decades. We understand that manufacturers are now looking um, and considering the uh, mRNA platform as potentially a, a basis for HIV and malaria vaccines. Financing and risk sharing instruments will be critical as well to incentivize industry investments moving forward. And the regulatory pathway have also facilitated this uh, rapid time to market. So we now know that if we're all working together, it is possible to reduce time to market for new vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ann. It's uh, very clear for us. Uh, I uh, continue with the questions. My, my question now is for Dr. Cage O'Brien. Dr. Cage, despite all the efforts of the WHO, we have seen few countries draining most of vaccines, while most countries are still having low vaccination rates. Uh, what have we learned about the importance of regional vaccine manufacturing? Please, uh, you also have five minutes to answer the question and to make any other comments you want. Thanks so much. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you, uh, dear chair and other uh, distinguished uh, panel members and participants in the, in the room. Um, I think, listen, what we've seen over the course of this pandemic has been uh, a really firm uh, global commitment and uh, global vision for getting vaccines out as quickly as possible. And, uh, and that first and foremost was underpinned by the amazing science um, that led to the development of vaccines in a period of time that I think was absolutely unimaginable um, for both scientists and, um, and uh, people who work on the program side of vaccines. But what we've also seen is that the manufacturing of those vaccines and the deployment of those vaccines has hit many roadblocks and has uh, stumbled over um, many obstructions for getting uh, vaccines in an equitable way where uh, they were most needed. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Much has been written about this, much has been said about it, 
much has been uh, opinioned, <laughs> opined on this. Um, the main issues have been the fact that as we went into the pandemic, there was a very constrained number of manufacturers who were supplying vaccines around the world. Uh, they were uh, situated in different regions around the world, but in Africa in particular, in the African region, um, with very, very few exceptions, there was not vaccine manufacturing taking place in the region. And I think as we look at the, the map of how vaccines actually made their way geographically, um, it, it, uh, there is certainly a correlation between the fact uh, that Africa was the region of the world that was most left behind in terms of distribution of vaccines, notwithstanding uh, the incredible uh, commitment, effort, and resources that have gone into um, a number of regional uh, uh, um, uh, financing facilities and the global financing facility that was COVAX that is providing about 80% of the doses in low income countries now. And so I, it, we, we really, I think this is a, a real step change um, in the experience that having regional manufacturing um, so that those uh, regional political geographic um, interests are, are served uh, is certainly the way of the future. Um, while at the same time, um, all the other efforts are continue to be uh, invested in to assure that there is equitable uh, vaccine distribution, not only for pandemic vaccines, but for uh, vaccines that are life-saving vaccines uh, for diseases that are not uh, of pandemic potential. There are some really tricky issues here about what exactly the manufacturing facilities are going to make outside of pandemic vaccines and what that market is going to look like um, in the future, because we had quite a stable market with about four to five billion doses of vaccine administered on an annual basis across all of the antigens that are make up um, uh, the vaccine um, program across countries. And we do have over 20 um, diseases for which there are vaccines now. So as we envision new manufacturers coming into the marketplace, and as that's happening already, the question really is, what exactly are they going to make outside of pandemic vaccines and how is that market going to stabilize? We're all interested in having healthy markets, healthy competition, healthy market dynamics so that there is secure and reliable um, uh, pipelines of supply that come into all countries to serve their programs across all of the antigens. So these are some of the issues that are still quite live right now. Um, and are still a matter of uh, development, a matter of um, production capacity, a matter of strategic decisions across manufacturers around the world. Um, but we are in a place right now, as you mentioned in your opening comments, that over 11.6 billion doses of COVID vaccines have been deployed. Um, and now we're facing a world where, um, although there are some countries that remain um, still in the phase of moving towards 10% coverage for some countries, for other countries still moving towards 20% coverage, um, but the, the largest bulk of countries have moved um, well into uh, much higher coverage levels, um, and especially for those um, subpopulations, and we'll probably get into this discussion, uh, that are most at risk of, uh, of developing severe disease. And that really continues to be um, the major focus for country programs is how to protect older adults, healthcare workers, and certainly that issue of um, in the future for pandemic vaccines, uh, especially is, is a regional manufacturing capacity um, so that many of these equity issues um, are issues of the past and are not faced uh, moving forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cage. And now, uh, Dr. Andres, uh, in Latin America, the situation was not different from other poor regions. Most countries with low vaccination rates. Uh, we know that uh, PAHO is supporting WHO in developing more local producers to reduce dependence on large pharmaceuticals. Uh, do you believe this is a good policy to improve vaccination rates in our region? And why? Five minutes, please, for you uh, to answer this question and or any other comments? Thank you very much, distinguished uh, chair, uh, panel members and colleagues. Um, it is a pleasure to be here uh, with you. 
Um, I would say that uh, it is very important to really uh, tackle the issue of availability of vaccines. If anything, COVID-19 has shown us that there were not enough vaccines at the beginning because they were just, they were just designed basically. And subsequently, there were vaccines in can some countries and none in others. So it's very important, it's critically important to have some equity based and investments in particular <clears throat> in developing countries so as to be able to have a faster access. On the one hand, on the other hand, we also see how the different variants of the virus will require new vaccines. And because of that, an expansion as WHO is supporting of, uh, uh, of, of uh, laboratories and, and, and areas in which surveillance is being undertaken is uh, essential. Um, PAHO has been uh, working with countries in the region uh, to provide a technical capacity to uh, improve the availability of vaccines and, and medicaments. And this is not new. There has been a very strong uh, work that has been uh, done uh, up to now for the last 10, 12 years, strengthening um, not, not only the facilities to do vaccines, but rather uh, elements such as the uh, interseritorial action and governance uh, with science and technology and, and health, looking at ways that uh, in research is actually uh, done and implemented in finance, and also to have a regional and sub-regional um, collaboration. And the issue here, I think, is that we can't just say, okay, any country that wants to start doing vaccines should do vaccines, because there are many issues in there. For example, we have to create an enabling environment to foster the manufacturing of quality medical products. So it's not simply um, the idea of having some funds to do something for a couple of years. Sustainability is also very important. So what we are trying to do is with national authorities uh, um, in, in countries is to identify which is this environment that is required in order to have more vaccines have accessible vaccines that are at the right price so that people don't have to pay out of pocket, have the element of equity, uh, which is essential for uh, this pandemic and the future pandemic, certainly, and also have products that are secure and efficacious. During the 59th uh, Directive Council, um, the countries of the region actually asked to create a platform, a regional platform for discussions between opportunities of production uh, of medicaments and technologies. And this was actually done. And in these uh, uh, meetings with, with countries, uh, there has been much progress done. And in order to move uh, forward, um, PAO has selected two centers to develop and produce vaccines for RNA, messenger RNA against COVID. Uh, one is the laboratory in Brazil, Biomanguillos, uh, which you are the, the director, sir. And the second one is in, in Argentina. This is going to be to produce vaccines initially for the region. That would be uh, the idea. And we're collaborating very closely uh, with WHO and in, in, in some of this work. In addition to that, we think that it's very important uh, to recognize that uh, the region does have the scientific um, and technologies and the capabilities to develop uh, vaccines. Um, what we need to do is to make sure that the actual um, organization of the work is done under very specific and rigorous uh, ways so as to make sure that the quality is going to be uh, very, very good. And in addition to that, when, with the strengthening of uh, national regulatory authorities. Um, we also have the 40 years of the immunization program in the region that has been very successful and it can be certainly a vehicle for these vaccines to find their way to 
um, to, to the populations that they are intended to. And on top of that, the regional uh, revolving fund, which is basically the, the, the platform that is uh, ensuring that the vaccines are going to be of good price or lower price as possible and uh, pre-qualified is uh, by, by WHO, of course, but also that they will be um, available uh, well in advance because of a projection of requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Andres. Uh, just one comment on uh, something you, have, you said. Uh, the, the notion that uh, uh, it's possible to uh, implement facilities in everywhere is not true. Uh, the, the, this, uh, the business of vaccine is very complex and it needs the accumulation of knowledge and a uh, uh, long time for uh, a country to be able to, uh, uh, to do that. So uh, we, need to, uh, we need to establish the places that we can uh, uh, foster the development of uh, facilities for vaccines. Uh, Dr. Akira, uh, it, it's your turn now. Uh, let's talk about new technologies. How, how do you see the role of emerging technologies for the immunization in this post-COVID era? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everybody. So nice contribution, uh, nice insights on this. Uh, let me start saying that uh, this uh, terrible pandemic, uh, we say in this table, uh, immunization in a post-COVID world. But uh, this is the future. No? WHO didn't uh, declare a past-COVID pandemic yet. So we still uh, are facing pandemic there. But we have uh, innumerous legacy received from the pandemic, especially in the science and technology related issues, you know? Never, never in the uh, public health history, we had uh, so many publications, so many uh, paper published in, in such short time, and we never had uh, such amount of investment in science and technology made by developed countries, especially by United States. In the United States of North America, they have organized the operation called the warp speed operation and invested $18 billion and in very accelerated way, a vaccine using innovative technology, uh, and, uh, the RNA messenger was developed in less than one year and uh, was used in the population. In less than one year, never, never we had a, a such accelerated development in, in the world. I would like to, uh, to consider, to, to think that we have a legacy, an important technological legacy, and we must use it, not only for the required uh, new COVID-19 vaccine, for, you know, the variant, variant virus, we may require a new vaccine. We must use this new innovative technology for development. And there are, there are many projects using these innovative technologies. And, but I think we must use this new technology also for other, require, other diseases. You know, we have uh, several different diseases. You know, that we never, uh, I think, if we, uh, we don't uh, take a, a look on this, we never will have vaccine against parasitic disease, tropical disease, you know, malaria. We have vaccine, but not enough, enough good. You know? 
uh, HIV uh, improved improvement of existing vaccine, you know, uh, well, because today's vaccine it requires many shots, many shots. We may uh, we need to develop a new vaccine using uh, less shots and protect or combination vaccine with less shot protecting several against several diseases. Also for COVID-19, you know, the existing vaccine today, it protects very short time and requires several shots, you know, two shots, uh, three shots, yeah, and uh, how many shots is interrogation mark, you know? And children, infants would be vaccinated. So we still have a lot of uh, development ahead and we need additional op operation warp speed in order to provide financing, funding, enough funding and enough, uh, enough uh, uh, political decision in order to get for this new vaccine we require for the public health, you know? And in this context, in this context, I think it is also important to say that there are today enough vaccine, COVID vaccine in the world. We have in our uh, organization called the uh, DCVMN, Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturing Network, you know, uh, uh, the vaccine, uh, the organization uh, with uh, more than 35 uh, laboratories producing vaccine, 12 vac COVID vaccine producer. And uh, the issue is there will be over production, over vaccine production, but not uh, demand, the, the demand is not there. Not, but there are more than 21 countries that have a, less than 15% of uh, 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 coverage, population, uh, the vaccination coverage, no? less than 15%. While we have uh, so many countries without proper vaccination coverage, we will face for sure no? the ap appearance of new variants and we must keep vaccinating in order to have a population protected. So uh, this is a very complex situation, very complex situation, but you, uh, your question uh, is uh, the, the use of this technology, new technology no? uh, in developing countries, at least for in developing countries. For this, we need the support for a good, good support, financial support, good technological support, good, you know, uh, 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 political support from multilateral institutions like WHO uh, in order to, to provide, uh, 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 in order to go ahead with this technology in regionally, regionally. This is, I think, uh, a way uh, that we must proceed, you know, um, uh, institution like institution like WHO, multilateral institution like WHO must have a, uh, and uh, support us in order to get the, uh, technology, in order to get the uh, pro uh, procedure to have a local production, but the regional production. I think we must select. Uh, regionally, some institution that will give answer, will give production, will give product for the public health. So this is, I think, my uh, the situation we have, we need to solve. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Kira. In our case, we we uh, firmly believe believe that uh, these new uh, platforms will uh, be very important in the future. And this way we are 
working with two new platforms, one of the viral vector and the other one is the developing of a vaccine in the mRNA technology. Um, well, now, now I'll come back to Dr. N. I'll make another question to, uh, for her. Dr. N, uh, how can efforts related to addressing bottlenecks to getting COVID-19 vaccines from ports to arms benefit immunizations in the future? Thank you very much uh, for the question. And I, I should uh, confess that I am not a doctor, but thank you very much just to be, be very clear on that. I don't wanna take credit for that. Um, I believe that unfortunately we have seen backsliding in, in the immunization coverage because of the pandemic and we do need to build back uh, better in 2020 because of the pandemic. 23 million children missed out on basic childhood vaccines through routine uh, health services, which is the highest number since 2009. And by April 2022, 57 vaccination campaigns in 43 countries remained postponed since the start of the pandemic. In the last 12 months, you may also be aware, we've seen 21 large and disruptive measles outbreaks, but we've also seen the first wild polio virus case in Africa uh, for six years. So these are all strong reminders to all of us about the uh, importance of ensuring uh, and uh, catching up on, on the doses that have been missed. So Kate was talking about the COVAX uh, facility, uh, which is a global facility uh, ensuring uh, equity and access. And, and also we're looking at 92 countries uh, that are funded by uh, donors to have uh, sufficient uh, vaccines. And we've had uh, quite a problematic year last year, as, as most of you know, until the first quarter of 2021, when supply finally started to roll at a, at a, a pace and in quantities that was uh, sufficient to, to meet country demands. And, and um, once the supply challenge had been uh, resolved, then the bottlenecks sort of uh, shifted to the in-country um, uh, activities uh, that were required. One of the challenges have been the uh, call chain capacity that was insufficient in many countries for them to take delivery of the vaccines as they became uh, available. So the cold chain was either insufficient or it was not appropriate to accommodate for the vaccines that they were allocated um, at the national level or through to the um, health facility. And the, you're all aware that the cold chain capacity is critical in order to protect the quality of the vaccine throughout the distribution within the country until it reaches the arm to ensure that it still um, provides the impact as, as it's um, required to do. So in 2021, UNICEF with funding from Gavi delivered 52,000 refrigerators, including solar powered refrigerators in areas where electricity is unreliable. And also with the Biden announcement last year uh, to donate 1 billion doses in June, there was a, a, an urgent requirement uh, to install a different uh, cold chain capacity with the ultra cold chain uh, that was not in place in, in countries and 800 ultra cold chain freezers were delivered to 70 countries in 21. Apart from the cold chain, obviously the many bottlenecks at the country levels um, are also um, having to be addressed and, and uh, WHO, UNICEF and Gavi in January established the COVID-19 vaccine delivery partnership with the purpose to support countries to achieve their coverage targets and with a focus on the, 20, the 34 countries which had the lowest coverage uh, at that point in time, less than 10%, we already talked about that. And the key principles of the partnerships relate to national ownerships, putting the uh, governments in the driver's seat, but also uh, collaborating uh, on one plan uh, with one country team and one budget at the country level and building on existing partner capacities and roles in the countries with the aim to strengthen also the routine immunization and primary health care in general while improving the COVID-19 coverage. The partnership is working with governments on, on four levers, so delivery funding, technical assistance, demand planning, and political engagement. And this was started up in, in January. And the latest number um, of countries with below 10% uh, coverage is now 19 countries, of which 15 of these countries are 
um, affected also by conflict and humanitarian crisis um, and with in general poor coverage um, of vaccinations or immunizations. So we do hope that the collaboration of the COVID-19 pandemic and the government commitment, as well as the cash inflow that we're currently seeing, will build, allow um, to build a new platform and help restore immunization services and vaccination campaigns to prevent and respond to outbreaks and also to catch up on the missed cohorts that we were talking about before. And preferably the COVID-19 immunizations will continue in an integrated uh, manner that it strengthens rather than undermines uh, childhood and other vaccination services. And the expansion of the cold chain, while the vision of course is that um, eventually we'll have a vaccine that would not uh, require cold chain, it will also not require a, a needle, but we're able to um, add a patch or, or what have you, then for the foreseeable future, we will still be dependent on, on the cold chain. So that's, um, yeah, hopefully the countries are in a better position to address immunizations after the COVID. And as Akira, Dr. Akira mentioned, we're not there yet in the post-COVID, but hopefully we're getting there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Miss Anne. Uh, as we are running late, I was wondering that we have little time left. So I, I, I'll try to make uh, some quick uh, questions uh, to the other uh, guests. guests. Uh, Dr. Cage, please. Uh, what has the COVID vaccine response taught us about vaccine policy development around optimizing vaccine schedules? So this is such an important question and one that is, um, you know, really, uh, I think, front and center for many, many countries um, about how to use the tools that we have, the vaccines that we have to their optimum capacity. And I really want to reinforce that the evidence that manufacturers are required to bring to regulators to authorize the use of the vaccine is not necessarily sufficient for policymakers to advise on how best to get the most impact out of the vaccines. And this is an area that plagues, um, not just for COVID vaccines, but for frankly, all vaccines that policymakers end up in settings, situations where they are being asked to advise on how best to use vaccines and doing so in an environment where the evidence is weak or the evidence is uh, simply uh, just not there in order to provide that best recommendation for how to use the products. So some of the examples, and I'll just go very quickly on this, um, is that we've seen on COVID vaccines in particular is products coming through. And of course, the primary target of the product is for prevention of severe disease, certainly prevention of death. Um, but we uh, are focused primarily on those groups that are at highest risk of disease. And we often have products coming with extremely limited information on performance in older adults, almost no products with performance and safety information on pregnant women, who are, uh, both of those are groups at high risk of disease. Um, we also had lack of information on subpopulations that are at high risk of disease, HIV infected people in, in particular. So these were examples where subpopulations that frankly were the most uh, targeted of populations for early deployment of vaccines we were missing evidence on uh, the performance and the safety of the vaccines, making, making it very difficult to deploy them to their maximum opportunity. The second issue was vaccines um, uh, on what outcomes that we wanted uh, to, to understand, to know the performance of the vaccines so that development of vaccines could progress um, to second generation vaccines with improvement against outcomes. And this is particularly true of transmission uh, prevention of transmission of, uh, of pathogens from one person to the next, where we certainly had evidence on the outcomes of disease, um, very little evidence on the performance of the vaccines to actually stop transmission from one person to the next or reduce it. And so again, an area that is critical for the public health benefit and policymaking for the optimum use of vaccines and operating in a relatively uh, data-free space. And then I think the, the third thing is the adaptability of the schedules um, to address durability over time and to address the performance of vaccines against variants. Um, and what we have uh, clearly seen and sort of learned from this is that um, policy making needs to be much more agile 
uh, than it has probably in the past. And it needs to be much more responsive to emerging data. And I think enormous gains have been made in data becoming available in a much more real-time basis. I really want to applaud every scientist in the audience, um, every manufacturer who has put data out uh, in the public domain at an earliest possible time so it can be assessed and can be acted on. And I think that's a move in this field that we'll never go backwards on. Um, I don't think we'll ever go back to the period when uh, evidence takes months and months to actually um, be available through the peer reviewed um, um, publication process. And then the final point that I'd just like to make is the commitment of manufacturers to follow through on uh, the evidence that is needed from real world studies. And we have learned such an enormous amount from vaccine effectiveness studies um, when vaccines are deployed in the real world and outside of the context. It's about um, durability of protection um, it's about the performance on um, if evolution over time, um, and certainly about the performance in groups that were not sufficiently large during authorization clinical trials um, to understand subgroup performance. So those are a number of areas, and especially as we move into TB vaccines, additional malaria vaccines, each one and, and more, group B strep vaccine, group A strep vaccine, um, each one of these is a lesson, I think, that we've learned um, for, for how to get evidence that actually makes the um, implementation of vaccines optimized um, for the impact that they can actually deliver on. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cage. Dr. Andres, uh, one more, more question for you. Uh, for COVID-19 vaccination in Brazil, the lowest levels of coverage occur in children aged five to year to 11 years old. In this age group, just over 20% received the complete vaccination schedule, uh, which points to parents' vaccination hesitance as at least one of the influencing factors. Uh, my question is, is this happening in other countries in our region? And what can be done to overcome this challenge? Thank you very much for, <clears throat> for this question. Um, let me just start by saying that the uh, vaccine hesitancy is in itself not a new phenomenon. The WHO actually named in 2019 vaccine hesitancy as one of the risks to global health long before the pandemic. But now with the pandemic, we actually are hearing more and more and more, especially in the media and in the public eye. Um, it's also very clear that the COVID vaccination increased uh, the hesitancy in many countries, especially in some part of the English Caribbean, at least in this region. And this is basically associated with a number of factors, including misinformation, disinformation in the epidemic, political, religious, cultural beliefs, low risk perception, very important. If, if you vaccinate me, I, I still can get sick and therefore why am I going to be vaccinated? Also concerns about safety, as we were saying, now the window of preparing a vaccine is much shorter and people think that uh, that's not a careful, uh, a careful way of, of, of doing vaccines, which is not true because this is very a very rigorous uh, process. Doubts about the development, distrust in the healthcare system. But I think that this important is to understand that vaccine hesitancy is really a very complex and context specific issue that can change with time, can change from communities, and can change from countries and regions. And that needs to be monitored. What is vaccine hesitancy understood and addressed at the individual and at the community level? We have been working in uh, PAHO with the countries of the America to understand vaccine acceptance and hesitancy for COVID vaccines among the different groups of the population and working with health workers and populations uh, to make sure that we get the right information and um, train also uh, individuals uh, within the communities having community dialogues, mass media and social media campaigns 
in order to redress this. Specifically, um, as it was mentioned uh, before, the WHO SAGE uh, group identified children and adolescents as the lowest priority group in terms of morbidity and mortality. And this is one of the reasons for which the identification of people above 65 years old, health workers uh, or immunocompromised patients were, are the priority and are still the priority. And because of that, countries are actually focusing on those priority uh, groups, at least uh, uh, at the beginning. Brazil does have a very uh, good record of uh, vaccination with COVID. I believe it's around 75% or so. Um, and it's, I think it's doing very rightly so in focusing uh, on this, uh, on this kind of this subgroups of the population that are uh, being uh, uh, prioritized. Further, uh, as coverage continues going up, then one can start focusing on uh, the less priority groups, priority in terms of morbidity and mortality. As well as countries, once they, uh, some countries are actually starting to utilize schools for vaccination uh, of, of children, and that can be an, an important strategy to increase that coverage. But as I said, once the, the coverage of the priority groups are being uh, uh, looked after. Uh, we have not actually done uh, studies assessing vaccine hesitancy of parents of, uh, of young children or on adolescents because we're focusing really on the uh, older older groups and that will come uh, uh, eventually once the coverage in these uh, groups are being uh, increased to the level that uh, that is required. Thank you very much. And thanks, Dr. Andres. Uh, Dr. Akira, a two, minute, two minutes answer for uh, uh, this last question, please. Uh, uh, WHO considered to declare end of COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 vaccination must reach 70% of vaccination coverage worldwide. It's known that the COVID-19 low vaccine coverage is under developing countries, uh, have only 15, uh, in under developing countries, have only 15% of coverage with one dose, and is a big global public health problem how to guarantee access for these countries. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Very difficult situation because uh, there are many uh, countries that uh, uh, receive the vaccine uh, and they, they couldn't take it to the population because of lack of infrastructure, lack of uh, uh, the, the uh, code chain, lack of uh, health structure, lack of uh, several things. So uh, this is uh, very important because uh, while we have uh, countries with very low vaccine coverage, it is the, the creation of a new variant is possible, you know? So uh, the world, must be alert because of a new, uh, alert, uh, new variant should come if this country continue to have a low uh, rate of uh, coverage, vaccination coverage. How to do that? I think this is a big challenge, a world challenge. The world should, uh, the countries, uh, developed countries and the rich countries should think about how to uh, contribute and help these countries to overcome their situation, their uh, lack of uh, infrastructure, uh, bad cold chain, uh, uh, and have all the system that it, it doesn't work. So, but 70% that was established was an expert group, expert group, main expert group joined there and said, oh, while we don't get 70% of coverage, uh, the, uh, we cannot drop the pandemic. I think it is, was a very important decision, you know? And myself, I think that 70% is minimum desired, percentage rate of coverage should be higher. So this is a very big challenge or a change. And it in the hands of 
a multilateral institution like WHO, like PAHO, like UNICEF, and Bill Melinda Gates, and all these multi, a big institutions to uh, must come join together there with COVAX uh, program and uh, try, Gavi and try to get this country vaccinated their population. So otherwise we will have a, a bad situation because of a new variant must, should appear you know, and uh, threaten the world, the public health world. But look, we have a low vaccination coverage, not only for COVID vaccine, we have a, low vaccination coverage for all the vaccine, you know, in Brazil oh, and South America and all other countries, they have a, a vaccination coverage uh, lowered, especially because of pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic there. So we must look for entire vaccination program to recover the low coverage of this vaccine because uh, otherwise the susceptible population will grow and we will have uh, the, uh, the uh, pre uh, disease immune uh, vaccination preventable disease again, back again. So measles is back here in Latin America, in Brazil, in Latin America, uh, but in Brazil, we still have measles uh, we have eliminated it already. Uh, polio is already there. Only few countries with a few cases of polio, but the virus, wild virus is there. So while we have wild virus circulating, we need to vaccinate our population. And the coverage of uh, uh, polio vaccine, IPV vaccine here in Brazil is still low. So we need to also take care of other coverage, vaccination coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akira. Unfortunately, you have to finish our session. Uh, you will not be able to uh, open uh, questions uh, from the audience. I think I can promise that if there is uh, questions posed in the chat, we can send to the, the our guests and uh, Ask them to answer and, and uh, give them back. Give them back uh, to you. Uh, I, I want to thank all the our guests. Uh, I think we have a very good, uh, very, uh, uh, very profitable, uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, we we've got uh, uh, there is much to do, of course, but we've got a very clear message from our guests. And thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Just, just one announcement before leaving. Uh, the next session is the poster oral presentation to recombinant influenza virus encoding a streptococcus pneumonia conserved antigen, a bivalent intranasal and intramuscular broad spectrum vaccine against pneumonia and flu. Uh, Kimberly Freitas Cardoso from Instituto René Rachou Fiocruz. <laughs>